Black Museum. Its affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Retro Radio Sunday on Weird Darkness. Each week I bring you a show from the golden age of radio, but still in the genre of Weird Darkness. I'll have stories of the macabre and horror, mysteries and crime, and even some dark science fiction. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. And if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Spreading the word about the show helps it to grow. If you're here because you're already a fan of nostalgic audio and print, you'll want to email weirddarkness at radioarchives.com. When you do that, you'll get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows for free. That email address again is weirddarkness at radioarchives.com. Coming up, it's an episode from The Sealed Book, a program of all the secrets and mysteries of mankind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds beyond belief. This episode we're about to hear is the third episode of the program, which aired June 3, 1945, on WGN in Chicago as part of the Mutual Network. The episode Death Spins a Web was written by Robert A. Arthur and David Kogan, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, with host Philip Clark as the keeper of the book. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. The Sealed Book Once again, the keeper of the book is ready to open the ponderous volume in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. All the strange and mystifying stories of the past, the present, and the future. of the book. What tale will you tell us this time? Hmm. What tale shall I tell you? I have here tales of every kind. Tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds and events strange beyond all belief. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let me see. Yes. Yes, here's a tale for you. The strange tale of an old woman. 
and of three heirs greedy for her millions. A tale I call Death Spins a Web. And here is the tale as it is written in the sealed book. In a great mansion far from the city, Mrs. Oliver Drake lies dying. Her door opens, and her attorney, Henry Arnold, enters. Good morning, Mrs. Drake. How do you feel today? Henry, two days ago, Dr. Smith told me I had two months to live. Well, that's how I feel, like somebody who has two months to live. <laughs> you take it well, Mrs. Drake. <laughs> Tell me, have those three worthless grandchildren gotten here yet? Uh, Blanche and Vivian have. They're outside in the hall now. But you want to see them? I don't want to see them, no. But I will. We have things to talk over. Of course. I'll send them in. Your grandmother will see you now. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Oh, Granny, darling, it's so nice to see you again. Why, you don't look sick at all. <clears throat> that might must be quite a disappointment to you, Vivian. Dear Granny, it's so good to see you again. How are you, darling? Mm, Dr. Smith says I may live for another ten years. <clears throat> now, Blanche, you mustn't look so downcast. Perhaps I can arrange to die sooner. Why, Granny, you know I didn't mean any... Hello, Granny. Sorry I'm late. Mm, our family playboy has arrived. Chris... These are your cousins, Blanche and Vivian. Oh, I'm very happy to meet both of you. Strange, Chris, that we've never met before. We've been to so many of the same places. Monte Carlo, Paris, Dovi. I'm sorry that we didn't, Blanche. Until now, I had no idea that I had such a beautiful cousin. Uh, Chris, I'm Vivian, one of your unknown polo admirers. I saw you play at Bentonhurst last year. You were magnificent. Mm, Chris is magnificent at everything that's a waste of time. By the way, Chris, whatever became of that princess you were married to? Oh, you mean Irina? We were divorced two months ago, Granny. Congratulations. What about you, Blanche? Hmm? Are you still married to that third husband of yours? Oh, 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 no, Granny. I got rid of him a year ago. What about you, Vivian? I'm free at the moment, darling. You know, if I were to search the entire world for the three most useless people... I don't think I could do better than you three. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you're undoubtedly right, darling. If I had my way, I'd cut you three vultures off without a penny and leave everything to charity. Unfortunately, under your grandfather's will, I have to divide the fortune among the three of you. But <laughs> I'm permitted to divide it any way I see fit. <laughs> but of course you're going to divide the money equally between us, aren't you, Granny? Mm, no, dear, that's just it. I'm not. What? I'm going to leave the fortune to just one of you. The other two will merely receive token inheritances. But why, Granny? I feel that one of you must be just a shade less useless to society than the other two. And to that one, I intend to bequeath the fortune. I see. And have you made up your mind yet? No. Ah? Uh? I want the three of you to live with me for a few weeks so that I can become better acquainted with each of you. And at the end of that time, I shall make my decision. <laughs> In the days that followed, Blanche, Vivian, and Chris spent a good deal of time with their grandmother. Mrs. Drake preferred to see them separately, and often, after one of the three had left her bedroom, there was a gleam of amusement in her eye, as though she were enjoying a private joke. Chris, meanwhile, working on a plan of his own, also saw a lot of his beautiful cousins separately. Oh, oh, Chris. Isn't it beautiful out here? You're very beautiful, Blanche. As beautiful as the night itself. <laughs> you don't have to say that, Chris. Just because there's a full moon. It's not the moon. Darling, life hasn't been the same since I met you. The moment our eyes met, I, w I was lost. Oh, Chris. Chris, I felt the same way. Only I... I didn't think you did. But I do, darling. Then... You're going riding with Vivian each morning doesn't mean anything? Oh, of course not. 
You're the one I love and always will. Oh, Chris. Chris, I do so want to believe you. I've been so unhappy. None of my husbands ever understood me. But I do, darling. And I love you very much. Oh. Oh. You know that now, don't you? Yes, Chris. Yes. I do. <laughs> It's a wonderful morning. Oh, the air feels so clean. Oh, you look lovely, Vivian, with your cheeks so flushed and your hair windblown. Look at me, Vivian. Oh, Chris. Chris, don't. You had no right to kiss me. Let me go. Your lips say let me go, but that isn't what your eyes are saying, is it, darling? No, Chris. No, it's not. Oh, Chris, this isn't just one of your famous flirtations. No, darling. I think I fell in love with you the moment I saw you. You do care for me, don't you, Vivian? Yes, Chris. Yes, I do. I understand you want to see me, Granny. Yes. Come over here, Chris. Hmm. Well, how did you make out? What do you mean? I said, how did you make out? With Vivian, of course. (laughs) So you know that I was out riding with Vivian. I know everything that goes on in this house. Vivian may not know that you took Blanche for a walk down by the lake last night, but I know. Oh, now, Granny, you're not going to give my little game away, are you? Oh, no, Chris, no. I find it very enjoyable watching an unmitigated scoundrel make love to two women at the same time. Well, after all, Granny... If you don't leave me the fortune, I have no choice but to marry whichever one of them inherits it. But they're such stupid women, Chris. You yourself are a rogue, but at least an amusing one. But those women... And that's the reason you ought to leave me the fortune, Granny. (laughs) The pity I'm not 20 years younger, isn't it, Chris? Then your charm might have some effect upon me. Yes, you're quite right. Well, Chris, you'd better get back to Blanche and Vivian. After all, one of them might be an heiress. And heiresses demand attention. <laughs> a week passed. A week in which Krauss Chris found it more and more difficult to play his little game. Blanche and Vivian stopped speaking to each other and it became steadily harder for him to convince each of them that he had no interest in the other. Good morning, darling. Oh, hello, Blanche. What? Aren't you even going to kiss me? Uh, Oh, of course, dear. Oh, Oh, Chris, I do love you so. This past week has been heavenly. Chris, you do love me, don't you? Darling, what a question... You know there couldn't be anyone for me but you. Then why do you spend so much time with Vivian? That's how I keep tabs on her. What? Well, what do you mean? Blanche, Vivian is cheating in an effort to get Granny's fortune. Cheating? How? The three of us agreed not to go see Granny unless she sent for us. Yes? Well, Vivian has already broken that agreement. Well, Several times she sneaked into Granny's bedroom to try to influence the old lady in her favor. What? Why, that dirty double-crossing two-timing... Chris, do you think Vivian's getting anywhere? Well, when Granny sent for me last night, she more or less hinted that it would be Vivian who would inherit the fortune. But, Chris, how how can you take it so calmly? We've got to do something. Please, darling, let me handle this. I have a plan to take care of Vivian and to take care of her very effectively. Hello, Vivian. How are you, darling? Let go of me, Chris. Let go. But but what's wrong, darling? Aren't you afraid Blanche may be wondering where you are? Oh, so that's it. Yes, that's it. Vivian, listen to me. Whatever time I've spent with Blanche hasn't been because I wanted to. All I've been doing is protecting our interests. Protecting our interests? You may not know it, but Blanche has broken the agreement the three of us had. She's been sneaking in to see Granny behind our backs. Why, that low-down, conniving, peroxide blonde. That's the reason I've spent so much time with Blanche. 
to learn if Granny is being influenced by her. And is she, Chris? Mm -hmm. Blanche seems to feel certain she's going to inherit the fortune. Oh, Chris, what are we going to do? You can do as you please. After I've spent days with that hag trying to protect our interests and ensure our future happiness, you accuse me of making love to her. I didn't say that. Well, you intimated as much. Oh, please, Chris, don't be angry. I'm terribly sorry I lost my temper. Oh, please say you forgive me, darling. Please. I'll never doubt you again. <coughs> A few days later, after a particularly severe heart attack, Mrs. Drake sent for her three grandchildren. I suppose you're wondering why I sent for you, aren't you? Naturally. Oh, yeah. Frankly, yes, Granny, darling. In the two weeks that you've been living with me, I've come to the conclusion that you three are the shallowest and most useless people alive. Why, Granny? If I could, I'd leave the entire fortune to charity. But the will of your grandfather provides that the fortune is to be divided among you. I want you to know that I've finally made my choice. You yeah. have? And who's the lucky one among us, Granny? Hmm. My attorney, Mr. Arnold, is coming from the city the day after tomorrow to draw up my will. When I'm dead, he'll reveal to you who the fortune goes to. <laughs> Until then, you'll just have to be patient and try to guess. And now the story continues as it is written here in the pages of the sealed book. For several days, Blanche and Vivian and Chris have waited in suspense to learn their grandmother's decision as to who is to inherit her money. Then one morning, looking very upset, Chris seeks out his cousin Blanche. Blanche? Chris, well, what is it? Is anything wrong? Everything's wrong. What is it? Chris, tell me. Early this morning, Granny sent for me. I managed to wheedle out of her who the fortune is going to. You did? Oh, Chris, who's going to get it? Vivian. Vivian. Yes. We're each to receive $5,000 while she gets millions. Oh, Chris. Chris, it's not fair. Oh, shh. Don't cry, darling. <laughs> I could stand the thought of losing the fortune. If it weren't that I'd lose you also. Well, Chris, what are you saying? We'll always be together. Oh, darling, there's no use pretending. If we're both penniless, we can't get married. Oh, Chris, it, it wouldn't matter if we were penniless. Really, it wouldn't. That's what you say now, Blanche, but I know better. Oh, no. Both of us are too used to luxury to do without it. And listen, if somehow Vivian failed to inherit the fortune, it would mean that either you or I would be bound to. In either case, we could get married and have our chance for happiness. Yes, you're right. Oh, I hate her. I hate her. Darling, if we want our happiness, we've got to fight for it. Chris, what are you talking about? If something were to happen to Vivian, our worries would be over. Chris, you don't mean... Oh, no. Darling, the happiness of two people is more important than that of one. And we could be so happy together. I can't bear the thought of giving you up. Oh, Chris. But murder would be caught. Not if we're clever, darling. Now, listen. This afternoon, suggest to Vivian that the two of you take the canoe and paddle to the other end of the lake. When you get about a mile from shore, you'll see me approaching in the motorboat. That will be the moment for you to tip the canoe over. Tip the canoe over? Yes. Then I'll pick you up and bring you back to the dock. As for Vivian, it was a simple case of drowning. By the time I reached the overturned canoe, she had gone under. You were the only survivor. Oh, Chris, I'm so frightened. Well, will you do it? Yes. I'll do it. If you want me to. Are you tired paddling, Blanche? No, Vivian. Oh, the lake is certainly deserted today, isn't it? No, it is this time of the year. Oh, but that water's cold. Oh. Here, a motorboat. Oh, look, it's Chris. He's coming after us. 
Hello, you two. Who wants a lift? Let, let's just ignore him, Vivian. <laughs> All right. We'll pretend he isn't there. He expects us to admit we're tired. <laughs> <laughs> shall, uh, shall we change places? I'm tired of paddling in the stern. All right, if you like. But be careful. These canoes tip very easily. Yes, I know. Uh, now you work your way slowly toward the stern while I make for the bow. Okay. Uh, now, we have to slide past each other. <laughs> this is a tricky part to changing places in a canoe. Blanche, look out. You're rocking the canoe. Oh, I, I can't help it. Look out. We're going over. Hey, what happened to you two? Chris. Chris, pick me up. Come over here and I'll help you onto the boat. Chris. Where are you? Here I am, Vivian. Chris, it's 30 yards to the boat. I can't swim that far. Chris, get me up. My clothes are dragging me under. Swim to the boat. I'll pick you up. Oh, Chris, I'm... don't let me drown. Chris. Chris. It's only another 20 yards, Blanche. Oh, Chris, my, my, my clothes, they're, they're so heavy. Oh, I'm getting so tired. It's just a few more yards, darling. A few more yards. I couldn't swim beyond that if, if my life depended on it. I'm afraid you may have to, darling. Chris! Chris, come back! Chris, don't let me drown! Chris! Chris, go! Hello, Granny. How are you? Have the police left yet? Yes, Granny. They asked me to convey their condolences over the tragic loss of your granddaughters. Oh, it was just one of those unfortunate accidents. Yes, wasn't it? It's a pity you weren't able to get there in time to save them, Chris. I shall never forgive myself for that, Granny. Mm, I'm sure you won't. Well, Mr. Arnold is waiting to see me about drawing up my will and naming my heir. But I no longer seem to have a choice in the matter. I must give you credit, Chris. You worked the whole thing out like a master. Why, Granny, whatever are you talking about? <laughs> you may have fooled Blanche and Vivian and the police to boot, but not me, Chris. What do you mean? Chris, do you remember when the thought first occurred to you that with Blanche and Vivian gone, you wouldn't head at all? Why, Granny... It was when you met your cousins for the first time in this room. The thought occurred to you because I said, it's a pity there isn't only one of you, then I wouldn't have to bother deciding who should inherit the fortune. <laughs> Come to think of it, I do recall your saying something to that effect. And when I did, your head came up and you stared at the two women, and then you smiled. And I knew exactly what you are going to do. <laughs> of course, this is all nonsense, but if you say you knew what I was going to do, why didn't you stop me? Because I wanted to see happen what did happen. But if you wanted me to inherit the fortune, why didn't you promise to leave it to me in your will without... Without forcing you to do what you did? Yes. Mm, my dear Chris, for reasons of my own, I wanted it to be quite impossible for those two vicious, stupid women to inherit my money. And equally impossible for you. Well, whether you want me to inherit the fortune or not, I'm going to. Oh, are you? <laughs> yes. Under Grandfather's will, there's no way you can prevent me from inheriting it. It's mine, come what may. Oh, is it? Yes. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You fool. There isn't any fortune. What? What are you saying? There are millions. There's nothing. Absolutely nothing. Everything your grandfather left was lost in the Depression. No, that can't be. You're lying. Lying, am I? <laughs> I've been paying the servants, my doctor bills, and other expenses by selling what few pieces of jewelry I had left. I have nothing now, nothing. No. <laughs> In fact, uh, I shouldn't even be surprised. If you had to pay my funeral expenses... <laughs> you witch! You planned this all from beginning to end. Getting the three of us here. Speaking of leaving the fortune to one of us, driving me on to, to drown the two of them. <laughs> yes, yes. 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I can't recall ever having had so much fun in all my life. <laughs> well, you won't be having it much longer. You made a mistake in playing me for the fool. <laughs> I don't think so. You did exactly as I knew you would. Everything I expected came about. <laughs> it did, did it? Did you expect this also? <sighs> you didn't expect this, did you? Well, why don't you laugh now? You'll never play anybody else for a fool. Mr. Drake, is anything wrong? I thought I heard... Good heavens, Mr. Drake, let go of her. Let go, do you hear? Let this go. This little thing she didn't count on. Let go of her. There. You can have her. She'll never play another little game like that. Mrs. Drake. Mrs. Drake. She's dead. No more than she deserved. Chris, what did you do it for? Murdering a helpless old woman. It's madness. Helpless, was she? Why, she tricked me into believing she had a fortune. Tricked me into killing to get it. What are you talking about? She tricked you into believing she had a fortune. She does have a fortune. You're lying. She said there wasn't a cent of the fortune left. You must have misunderstood her. She's worth at least eight million dollars. And with the death of your cousins, you were the sole heir to it. Eight million dollars? But Chris, no matter what you do now, that fortune can never be yours. I saw you kill your grandmother. And under the law, no murderer can inherit anything from his victim. And she planned this, too. She always said she didn't want me to have her money. And she fixed its way so it would all go to charity. But I'll show her. I'll show her. It's mine, do you hear? Mine, mine, mine! <laughs> so in the end, old Mrs. Drake defeated her three greedy grandchildren after all. But what a strange way to disinherit anybody. It looks as if murder ran in the family, doesn't it? But the sound of the great gong tells me it's time to close the sealed book again. One moment, keeper of the book. What story will you tell us next time? Next time? <laughs> Would you prefer a murder or a tale of the supernatural? Remember, I have all the stories that ever happened here... And all that have yet to come to pass. But I'll find one for you in just a moment. Keeper of the book. Have you found the tale you'll tell next time? Yes, yes, I found one. It's the story about a girl who goes to live on an island, a very strange island, where the dead walk by night and weird voices sound in the wind. I call the story <coughs> Devil Island. <laughs> Be sure to be with us again next time. The sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting story from... The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. 
Thanks for listening to this week's Retro Radio Sunday episode of Weird Darkness. If you haven't done so yet, be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. And if you like the show, please share it with someone you know who also loves old-time radio and pulp audio. If you want to hear even more, drop an email to weirddarkness at radioarchives.com and get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows absolutely free. That's weirddarkness at radioarchives.com. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness 2023. I'm Darren Marler, and I'll see you next week for Weird Darkness's Retro Radio Sunday. Hey weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.